Talk to us about what you're seeing and hearing now from school districts. Frankly, I'm terrified about whether my school is going to start or not and what that means for my children. What are schools telling you? Yeah, and this, you know, a lot of my data is even about a week ago when before this recent uptick in COVID. And what we've been hearing is, you know, the school districts had just gotten out of the room with the epidemiologists telling them what social distancing has to happen, who can come and who can't. And most of the districts we've been talking to, they were looking at things like a shift-based model where half the kids show up on one day and then the other half show up the next day. But they were still going to have to plan for a scenario where uh, some subset of the kids are not going to be able to come on a regular basis because their families just don't feel comfortable with that. Uh, and so that was pre-COVID. They were talking about things like maybe the high school students stay virtual so that the elementary and middle school students can use the high school facility so that they can be socially distanced. So even in that world, they were thinking about a hybrid model of how do you leverage technology, things like Khan Academy and video conferencing, you know, Zoom, Skype, whatever else, uh, and when possible, the physical environment. And now over the last week or two, we've seen this uptick in COVID. And if you extrapolate that out for about another month when they're going to have to make the go, no-go decision about back to school, uh, I think it's looking increasingly likely. It, it might look a lot more like, like April or, or May than it, than it does uh, like a normal back to school. So what does that mean for distance learning and programs like Khan Academy? I mean, do you see being integrated into the curriculum now, you know, potentially more so for, for years to come, given the experience that parents and schools have had uh, with your program over the last four months? Yeah, you know, the whole reason, even pre-COVID, why Khan Academy we exist as a not-for-profit is we've always thought learning should not be bound by time or space. Everyone should have access to world-class materials. Students should be able to fill in any gaps they have. Teachers should have the data they need to address the, the variance in any classroom, that there's 30 kids all with different needs, all ready to learn at different paces. And then COVID hit. And we saw overnight our traffic became 250, 300% of normal. Teacher registration, student registrations were 10 times normal. Uh, parent registrations were 20 times normal. And so we've just been trying to do kind of a full court press on what else can we do to support not just the U.S. school system, the global school system through this crisis? So we've been doing things like daily schedules, parent-teacher webinars, uh, learning plans. We have a learning plans already out for to keep people learning through the end of last school year and the summer. And now as we go into this back to school, this was even before we saw this uptick in COVID again, when we know that kids are going to have even larger gaps in their knowledge than they would have after a typical summer learning loss. Uh, we've been launching things like get ready for grade level courses, which have already been launched. They actually got launched last week, where if a student, say, a rising sixth grader, they can go to the get ready for sixth grade math course so they can make sure they can fill in all their gaps before they show up for sixth grade, and then they can learn at their own time and pace. Given how unusual this back to school is going to be, whether it's a shift-based model, socially distanced model, hybrid model, I, I think there's just the reality that people are going to have to lean more on Khan Academy and video conferencing than they might have at any other time. And I do think some of this is going to have long lasting implications. You know, one silver lining of all of this is that people have been talking about the digital divide forever. Uh, and it's been very clear that as soon as the school closures hit, that there's a subset of kids, 20, 30%, who didn't have adequate internet and computers at home. That has always been a barrier for them to be able right. to adopt tools like Khan Academy. People are really serious about solving that. So I think it's going to allow if that gets solved or gets closer to being solved, the whole system can lean more heavily on things like this than they normally would have. Now, there's been talk about the so-called COVID slide or the expected learning loss that might come as a result of all of, you know, schools being closed, you know, in some cases indefinitely. And I know Khan Academy has been helping there, has been a lifeline uh, for parents. But, you know, otherwise, how big do you think that COVID slide is going to be and how much of a concern is that for you? It's a huge concern. You know, you always, we've had school closures before. It's called summer vacation. And it's well documented that summer vacation, not only do kids not learn for three months, but they forget. They atrophy over those three months. So you, you're not learning and you're forgetting two or three months of content from the year before. With COVID, kids being out longer, five, six months, not only are they not learning for those five, six months, uh, some of our assessment partners, the NWEA, another not-for-profit, uh, their analysis thinks that it could be a year of learning loss. And, and what's really scary about that is that's a year on average. So maybe your or my children might be able to keep up and not have much learning loss at all because they're able to stay engaged. Their schools have had the resources to keep them learning. 
And so for every kid who is able to keep up, that's probably another kid who's maybe losing two years or two other kids uh, who are losing a, a lot more. And then another thing that a lot of people are starting to bring up is, you know, I think we've all been in a situation, we know people, if you've been out of the workforce for a year or two, it's very hard to even just get into the patterns of work. Imagine if you're an eight or a nine-year-old or 12-year-old who just hasn't been in the patterns of school for a year, uh, what that might do uh, to their ability to engage. So people are, it's a really scary thing. People are talking about a, a potential lost generation. So quickly, we've got about a minute left, Sal. What is your advice to parents whose children might be in that situation? What can they do? My advice is as much as possible, try to keep them learning over the summer. It doesn't have to be something complex. It could be as little as 20 minutes a day. Khan Academy is free, not-for-profit, non-commercial, no catch there. We're funded with philanthropic donations. So try to keep them learning on Khan Academy, uh, especially in math, because that's where the gaps hit you the most if you, if you let those skills atrophy. As you go back to school, hopefully uh, your teachers are going to be able to use our Get Ready for Grade Level courses. Uh, and, uh, you know, don't stress about it. At the end of the day, the key is build a habit, whether your, your, your school is supporting it or not. If your children can get 20 or 30 minutes a day in math, reading, and writing, uh, they'll be okay. But if they don't get that, then we could get into some of these scarier scenarios. Saul, so we've got about now a minute left, um, and you're joining us as, as part of some special Boston coverage coming up. You went to school in Boston. You started your career in Boston. It's obviously a place where there are several storied educational institutions. How much of an impact did the city have on you and this original Khan Academy idea? 30 seconds. <laughs> Oh, well, no, I mean, I kind of, uh, you know, uh, Boston, I have some of my best memories there. I went to undergrad and grad school in Boston. Uh, huge impact on me. You know, I have to say, Khan Academy, in many ways, my, my undergrad, uh, is, I went to MIT, and, you know, they did open courseware in the late 90s, early 2000s. And they said, as a matter of principle, knowledge should be free to the world. And they took that on themselves. And so when I started Khan Academy, there was debate about whether it be for-profit or non-profit. I remember that stake in the ground that MIT okay. took.